What separates a true knight from that of just a warrior? What separates a true knight from somebody who has just received the honorary title of a knight? A knight lives by a code, a code that was developed hundreds of years ago and based off of a Christian testimony of the faith. Today we are going to be looking at the ancient codes of chivalry and the militia templi and understand how the two are intimately connected towards the founding of the primitive rule for which the modern rule of the militia templi is taken from. But before going any farther, let's start off by defining what chivalry is. Chivalry is only a name for that general spirit which disposes men to heroic actions and keeps them conversant with all that is beautiful and sublime in the intellectual and moral world. That is taken from Henry Henry Digsby, The Broadstone of Honor. He was a Catholic historian from the 1800s. I believe he was a convert to the Catholic faith from Anglicanism during the Romantic period. Uh, this was a time of great rediscovery of the spirit of chivalry uh, as a reaction to the excesses of the French Revolution, which were so bloody and horrified most of Europe. Uh, so we can see from this that knightly or chivalrous behavior encompasses then not just how we treat our neighbors, but also the manner in which our duties are executed. So it is a spirit that stays within us and wants us to be connected to everything that is good and wholesome in the entire world. Most of the time, though, when somebody says to us, well, um, you know, he's not very chivalrous or that man is very chivalrous, it is almost always connected to a person's individual uh, courtesiness, especially towards a, a member of the opposite sex. If you've ever seen a woman shun before, you'll hear her make a remark like, well, I guess chivalry is dead. Um, but uh, that is a very narrow and actually courteous behavior for chivalry is so far down the line in the codes of chivalry, the ancient codes of chivalry. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's what it's become today. And it's also somewhat chivalry is almost disparaged as the uh, rise of feminism and other things have brought about um, a very difficult to deal with member of the opposite sex. Oftentimes you see men who treat the fairer sex with kindness or, or courtesy uh, disparaged as white knights or white knighting, or sometimes the excessive behavior or courtesy even to the point of madness is described as chivalry, almost like a, uh, a Dudley Do-Right or a Don Quixote, but of marching valiantly off into being uh, mistreated by uh, the fairer sex. Uh, but chivalry really, in its fullest view, is the religious, moral, and social code that govern the actions of knights and nobles. Now, every single person can live by a rule or a code, and we certainly know that our Lord instructs us to do so. So every Christian lives by a code. Why the code? Of, but the code of chivalry, more or less, was a code that was adapted to a very specific group of men. And those men were the rulers of society or were the basically the officers that sought to the execution of a rule within society. So we see with a knight that it is not just um, any man per se uh, who could just claim knighthood in the medieval period, but these were men of distinguishment that used their extra, their excess, to uh, wage war against uh, evil men, uh, to uphold the law of the kingdom, uh, and pledge themselves to the defense of the weak and the defense of the church, who, of course, maintains no armies to defend herself. So with a knight, more or less, it was a code to govern men with extra. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. Men knighted on the battlefield and so forth for distinguished uh, heroism who were not nobility, and you can also, and, and there are many exceptions in terms of people being made knights, more for violence or namesake or uh, anything else that was not related to being good and holy, but just being an ambitious man. But that is its fullest view, is the uh, code of behavior for men, arguably with extra or assigned to a specific duty that gave them authority over others. 
So nowadays, there's lots of knights movements. You see this everywhere. And I mean, there's a, a there's a lore about knighthood that I think most men find extremely attractive. And there's a nostalgia for the period. It seems like a simpler time. Men were men. Ladies were fair. There was a very clear villain, whether we take the mythical dragon, um, which is a type, of course, for the devil, or we take something like the Mohammedan, uh, who was raging war in the Holy Land. Everything seems to be much simpler in our view of the medieval world. And so either men cling to that because they wish for those simpler times where evil could be openly fought, or perhaps uh, it is just the fact that this code of manliness, uh, this code of behavior was viewed as the ideal for men versus um, the, the ideals of modern pop culture, which presents men at the same time of both being stupid, delicate, or um, complete savages uh, one way or the other. So there's an immense attraction to knighthood, and many people wish to claim that for their own, including pagans. Uh, you definitely see a lot of pagan groups uh, try to make up some type of knighthood that exists out there. And then even within the church, you have many groups, uh, either they have historic ties like the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre or uh, modern inventions like the Knights of Columbus. But there's a tremendous attraction to the idea of knighthood. So what is the difference between being attracted to knighthood with the idea of living by the ideals of knighthood? or just kind of having a nostalgia for the period. So in the Militia Templi, we embrace a code of life found both in the rule and the code of chivalry. And the code of chivalry is kind of a, a, a hazy fog because it wasn't like at some point somebody wrote down and said, this is the code of chivalry that everybody is going to live by. There were many written down, but we're going to see by looking at a few of them how much overlapping there was between these ideas and chivalry. And then those overlapping ideas will say is the code of chivalry. Our way of living has real obligations and will require sacrifices and changes to a person's way of living. Uh, a nostalgic view of the knighthood becomes enamored with the particulars of historic knights, such as horseback riding and jousting, the historic weapons of knights, swords, lances, shields, the study of the training and fighting systems used historically. And so I think as a novice, as you discern your vocation with the militia template, um, or maybe you're seeing this and you are discerning it right now, ask yourself what attracts you immensely to the knighthood. Is it something that you want to quest for virtue? You want to live out a code of life? You want it to change your behavior and your way you live practically? Uh, that means making more time for prayer, more time for service, and also enduring um the training of both your intellectual and moral life specifically, a harder training perhaps than what is required of a, a normal layman, although we are all required to pursue perfection. Or is it a, really a desire to do living history, like reenacting or uh, maybe, you know, to study uh, intensely uh, the period of medieval history uh, as a form of pleasurable entertainment? So none of these things are bad. I mean, horseback riding and jousting, although I did want to mention that at one point the church did uh, pretty much condemn jousting. And of course, our Holy Father, St. Bernard, uh, used to be just uh, in his life, you'll see him hating men going off to the wasteful time of jousting. Uh, but none of them are provided by our order, uh, the Militia Templi. Um, if, if you were also to choose to pursue any of these more historical ideas of, of chivalry or, or knighthood, um, that's a significant time of, of uh, money um, and time, and it could be even bad. It could interfere with your ability to give practical service to the church today. So do we want to pursue, do we want to try to live by knighthood, or are we just being nostalgic? So we see this in the, um, the decree promulgating our rule of life. Uh, we see this in the letter. It says, A rule had to be dictated also for the new order of the poor knights of Christ of the reborn militia Templi, and our general chapter has unanimously approved its text based on the old rule. Uh, the old rule is, of course, alluding to the ancient rule of the Templars, adapted to today's requirements at the aims of a modern Christian testimony through the ideals of knighthood. 
And then, of course, in the rule itself, it says, finally, referring to a novice, uh, his knightly formation shall be seen due teaching him the history of chivalry and its true ideals, which we aim to do in this presentation to start to talk about the true ideals of knighthood. So we see here that our goal is not an authentic um, living history, um, nor is it first and foremost the formation of a paramilitary group dedicated to training at arms. Our first and foremost reason for studying chivalry is to, through its ideals, provide men a framework for a modern Christian testimony. So when we're, if you, people talk about their spirituality in the church, you know, and you have Dominicans, Carmelites, all these other groups within the church, uh, we have also, in addition to the entire patrimony of the church, but we study in particular our own rule of life and the codes that govern the behavior of ancient men at arms, but as a tool to provide us the means to do a, um, a modern Christian testimony in front of other men and all of human humankind or mankind. So what is practical chivalry then? That's what we're all about, practical chivalry. Uh, the militia Templi aims to provide is a spiritual and intellectual formation in the ideals of knighthood. This instruction leads to men willing to dedicate their lives to fight without respite for the rights of God and Christianity, that's in the rule, by their commitment to a life of prayer and work in their apostolate. This then allows them to become knights in deed more than in word with the association of other brothers bound to the same ideals under the watchful guidance of Holy Mother of the Church. And I wanted to add to that, any type of knighthood that tries to remove itself from dedication to the Christian faith really is not knighthood at all. It certainly isn't governed by the code of chivalry. It certainly isn't rooted in anything other than um, the ideal of this kind of Levitic, you know, noblemen have the right to elect certain men to be awesome above other men. Uh, when in reality, knighthood is at first and foremost concerned with being a servant to the rights of the church and the rights of widows and orphans. We will see. So let's start off with one of the most ancient texts, which um, more or less within the text itself had in it a code of chivalry. So this wasn't spelled out like in a list. There was no blog post back in the uh, 700s that said, uh, you know, top 17 things that make you a good knight. But taking from the Song of Roland, which we'll discuss in a second, here are 17 points about what makes a true knight to fear God and maintain his church to serve the liege lord in valor and faith, to protect the weak and the defenseless, to give succor to widows and orphans, to refrain from the wanton giving of offense, to live by honor and for glory, to despise pecuniary reward, to fight for the welfare of all, to obey those placed in authority, to guard the honor of fellow knights, to eschew unfairness, meanness, and deceit, to keep faith, at all times to speak the truth, to persevere to the end in any enterprise begun, to respect the honor of women, never to refuse a challenge from an equal, never to turn the back upon a foe. And I think we'll see that from looking at this code, the first and foremost is to fear God and maintain his church. And when we look at what chivalry has more or less become when people discuss it, or if we say somebody's a knight, like... Um, uh, how separate it's become does i mean does anybody really take seriously the knighting of uh, of gentlemen like um, sir elton john as somebody who fears god and maintains his church i i wouldn't think so we also see within the rule allusions all over the place to holy scripture um definitely the third and the fourth um, I immediately think of the first epistle of the Apostle St. James, where he says, you know, true religion undefiled before the Lord is this, the relief of widows and orphans. Mm -hmm. We also see within our rule how it encompasses all the most noble ideas of this code of chivalry, everything from fearing God and maintaining his church, the weak and the defenseless, 
um, but also to refrain from the wanton giving of offense. Uh, we say in it that we never um, return insults and slander if somebody insi insults us. Uh, to despise rewards, our very motto, no nobis domine, no nobis, you know, we do not do the good works, hopefully, the, we do not engage in our apostolates for the church, we do not live for virtue in the hopes of rece receiving honors, money, or attention, that we do so in, in quietness and humility, um, to obey those placed in authority all over the rule that discusses the importance of obeying um, the superiors of the order, the grand master, uh, the bishops within a diocese, and so on and so forth. All of these could be found more or less within our rule of life. So what is the Song of Roland? Um, so Roland was, a, uh, was the nephew of Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor, um, but uh, he was the embodiment of chivalry. So, I mean, he, his, his epic poem was written in the 700s, but it was still being read by knights in the 1400s. Um, he was it. He was the man's man. You know, we love our modern movies of, you know, the hero who uh, fights it out into the bitter end. And that was Roland. That was the epic story of Roland, a man who was surrounded at all odds, his last act, is literally killing an enemy who feigned being dead before commending his soul to God's mercy. Um, anyway, so the uh, his story is told in the epic poem, The Song of Roland, which is all written in poetic verse. It is also considered to be the oldest major work of French literature, uh, and it recounts uh, the Battle of Roncesvaux. I believe that's, I hope that's how you say it, um, in 778. Uh, so let's, I have a little extract here um, taken from uh, a kind of adaptation of the uh, ancient poem um, called Roland the Hero of Early France. It's written more in novel style. The original is actually written in poetic verse. Then he flung himself on the ground under a pine tree with his face towards the earth, his sword and the oliphant beneath him, his face to the foe, that Charlemagne and the Franks might see when they came that he died victorious. He made his confession, prayed for mercy, and offered to heaven his glove, in token of submission for all his sins. Mea culpa, O God, I pray for pardon for all my sins, both great and small, that I have sinned from my birth until this day. So he held up around so he held up towards heaven in his right hand his glove, and the angels of God descended around him. Again Roland prayed, O very Father, who didst never die, didst bring St. Lazarus from the dead again, didst save St. Daniel from the lion's mouth, save thou my soul, and keep it from all ills, that I have merited by all my sins. Again he held up to heaven his glove, and St. Gabriel received it. Then, with the head bowed and his hands clasped, the hero died, and the waiting cherubim, St. Raphael, St. Michael, and St. Gabriel, bore his soul to paradise. I also wanted to make a quick allusion to another thing that um, because the Militia Templi, of course, our queen is Our Lady, uh, Our Lady Queen of the Militia, um, knighthood was also intimately connected to devotion to the Virgin Mary, something that we will get in more. But if you're curious, you can definitely go to uh, alleluiaaudiobooks.com and there there's a um, an audiobook called Our Lady of Chivalry, which discusses the knighthood's deep uh, love for the Virgin Mary. So, taken from the text, Life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with history of devotion to her, we see that uh, the priest who wrote that actually indicates that his last act on the battlefield was to have his sword given to a shrine of Our Lady, and that it was done. So that was his actual last act versus what the poem said. Okay. So another very important work on chivalry, which came much later, hundreds of years after the Song of Roland. And I want to also mention that knights, when they would go to their tournaments or engage in their training, that, you know, evening recreation more or less was listening to people singing songs. And the songs they loved to hear singing were these epic poems, and that's why they were written in verse. And of course, many knights were illiterate, 
But uh, that didn't, what happened as a result of that was not that the men were stupid. It was that they memorized everything from verse and song. Uh, so this, these ideas, the ideals of Roland very much were well known throughout Christendom and throughout uh, knighthood, especially in France. So a later work uh, was called The Book of the Order of Chivalry, or uh, Knighthood, The Book of the Order of Knighthood, by Blessed Raymond Lowell. He was actually beatified by uh, St. John Paul II, um, I believe in the 80s. Uh, he was a martyr. He, had a, he was a knight. I believe he had a conversion experience and became a hermit uh, and kind of a quasi-Catholic apologist at the time. And then from there, he decided that he wanted to convert Muslims to the Christian faith. And when he went there to do that, he was eventually martyred, I believe, after winning several debates. Um, some of his other works are uh, less than edifying. Um, they were, I believe at least one of them was actually condemned after his death because uh, he tried to adapt Abelard's teaching, who actually our Holy Father, St. Bernard, um, pretty much defeated his errors against the faith. Uh, but more or less, it was over the harmony between reason and faith of course, the church eventually sided with St. Bernard and taught that, no, faith is always a grace. It is never derived through reason. And Abelard taught that reason could um, lead to faith. And uh, later when the church condemned that, Raymond Lull tried to say that both reason, um, reason in harmony with grace led to faith. And the church also condemned that. Um, but anyway, so... These are all taken from that text, and it literally says within the text, the duty of a knight. So we're going to read through these as his code for chivalry, and there's a lot more there. And there's a huge section on the importance of knights defending from the church that hopefully at some point we will go over together as well. The duty of a knight is, support and is to support and defend the holy Catholic faith. The duty of a knight is to support and defend his earthly lord. The duty of a knight is to, is to support his land. The duty of a knight is to have a castle and horse, to guard the highways and to protect those who work the land. The duty of a knight is also to search for thieves, robbers, and other wicked folk in order to punish them. The duty of a true knight is to accuse a traitor and to fight against him. Charity is a kind of love that every knight must have in order to fulfill his duty. Charity makes a man bear lightly the heavy burdens of chivalry. I wanted to add that last one. He actually goes over how all the theological virtues help a knight. And one of the neat things about the book of the order of chivalry of knighthood uh, or of knighthood by blessed Raymond Law is the fact that at this point in history, knighthood had more or less become absolutely corrupted. It probably always had problems because we've always been afflicted with original sin. But during the high medieval period, it wasn't like knight, the majority of knights were virtuous men. In fact, the majority of knights probably were not virtuous men at all. Uh, in fact, this is very important to understanding the founding of the uh, ancient order, the Knights Templar, as a uh, is something to try to be live out the true code of chivalry versus this very worldly opulent uh even evil code that instead of relieving widows um injured them constantly so we definitely will take a look i hope we will take a look at the book of the order of chivalry later and he was trying to spell out in his work he was trying to admonish knights to remind them of his true duties. And we also see, once again, there's this harmony between supporting the Holy Catholic faith, though, also, and we constantly see, you know, defend your liege lord, defend your land, and so forth. And that was re referring to that martial aspect of knighthood. But it's also, if you think about it, an illusion between the first and the fourth commandments. So, first, we always put God, but second, you know, beneath that, you know, the first three commandments deal with God's honor, his glory, his name, the need for worship of him. But immediately the fourth one is, you know, honor thy mother and thy father. And any text of moral theology will more or less tell you that that extends way beyond just our paternal parents. That extends upon to our nations. That extends upon to our elected leaders. That extends upon our bosses and employment. And a knight is going to be first and foremost, right after loving God, is going to love these men. Play, he's 
who were placed above him in an authority, including his country. And it doesn't say the duty of a knight is to support his and defend his earthly lord if he likes him. Obviously, we would never do anything evil, but a deep sense of love of country and patriotism is always going to be a part of, you know, the knighthood. I also wanted to add this last one here because it was alluded to in the song of Roland. It, it says to live by honor and for glory. And there's another work, which uh, is another French work, I believe, um, the Theatre des Honneurs et des Chivalres, I hope. Um, this is an excerpt translated in uh, The Broadstone of Honor by Digsby. The true point of honor, on which our renown must depend, is the being a good man, and that is, and that is the true natural honor. And as for that which is acquired, it consists, like the first, in loving and fearing God, and not in imagining any honor which is not in his honor, which is the commencement of all wisdom, to serve one's king faithfully, to obey the laws, and to fight bravely for him and for his country, to follow the truth, reason, justice, and equity, to love and assist one's neighbor, to protect widows and orphans, to succor the poor and oppressed." to obey rulers, whether ecclesiastical or military or civil, and in all his actions to invent that probity, that generosity, that virtue, the price and recompense of which is true honor, and it is useless to seek its identical point anywhere else. And if we wish to rise still higher above these precepts, we must imitate Jesus Christ our Savior in forgiving our enemies, and then we shall possess not only the true temporal honor, but also that which is heavenly and eternal." And to add to that, the rule of the militia template adds that we always, we always pray and we always love our enemies. It is a duty. It is explicitly mentioned. It is explicitly taken from um, the uh, ancient rule. It is explicitly, of course, our ancient rule is taken from the rule of St. Benedict. And of course, it is explicitly a Christian idea taken from the gospel. And so we see here that knighthood, while it is definitely, we always vision knights as destroying evil men or stopping evil men. Um, it, is a, it is a stopping evil men for their own good. It is a stopping evil men to prevent them from committing more sin. It is a stopping evil men because they are actively doing evil. Um, and that, but it is always done with the idea of love of our enemies. And we always pray for them and hope they are converted. So, Blessed Raymond Lull says in his uh, Book of the Order of Knighthood, The responsibilities of a knight constitute both the source and purpose of the order of chivalry. If a knight does not perform his duties, he is contrary to his order and to the entire origin of chivalry. As a result of such a contradiction, he is not a true knight, even if he continues to bear the name. So, that is, and to kind of bring us back to the earlier theme, you know, what is a knight? Uh, Digsby says more or less that it's this love of the, uh, you know, whatever is beautiful and, and, and it's a spirit that rests within men. And so we more or less see what a man's spirit is by how he chooses to live. But I think any group that takes upon itself the name of knighthood, uh, whether that's the Knights of Columbus or the Holy Sepulchre or the Militia Templi, people are going to judge it based on probably one of three ways of looking at it. It's first and foremost uh, what we aim for. They are true knights of virtue. They are true men of great conduct. And the second that they might look at another group, if their men were not of true or great conduct, is it is an honor bestowed upon them because of their relationship, their hereditary uh, um, to some ancient noble or something that's bestowed on them as an honor from a king or maybe a bishop. So somebody else has deigned to say this man is great for whatever. And of course, it injures all men who call themselves a knight whenever uh, somebody who does not live an upright light receives the title of knight, whether it's that in our order or whether it's somebody like Elton John of England. It, it makes the whole thing seem silly and a laughing stock when a man does not live by virtue, even if that. And the third, of course, is living history. Do they study at arms? Do they are they real warriors? And I want, but I to emphasize, a man can be a great warrior and not be a knight at all. 
And, uh, and that has been with us since the ancient times before knighthood even existed. It's been in pagan cultures as well. There was a difference between, obviously, a samurai and just a ronin bandit. Uh, there, one lived by a code and for honor, another one did not. And so we really want to make that distinguishment that we are about living by a code of life. That is how we will provide a uh, Christian testimony in the modern world is by choosing to live a life of virtue. And that if we become that, we are true knights. If not, we cast shame, not just upon ourselves, but upon the order, upon everybody who calls themselves a knight. And so it is better for you as a novice, as you discern, if you do not want to live by the code of chivalry, to decide never to become one than to become one and to not live up to the ideals. And we see this in uh, it's a, this idea of either choosing to go all in or not going in at all. Uh, it is part of our Christian faith as well. We suddenly see in the second epistle of Peter um, in verses 20 through 22 here. Uh, for by whom a man is overcome, of the same also he is a slave. For flying from the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they be again entangled in them and overcome. Their later state has become unto them worse than the former. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of justice than after they have known it to turn back from that holy commandment which was delivered to them. For that of the true proverb has happened to them. The dog is returned to his vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And then I, to go back to it, I already alluded to it, but we see here that the aims of modern Christian testimony through the ideals of knighthood. We must fully embrace this way of life. And I alluded earlier that unlike just receiving an honorary title, Unlike starting to study how to use broadswords, unlike just training to be a man of combat, you know, of actual physical martial combat, we change our lives. To become a knight is to, in the militia temple, is to be converted into a very specific way of living. And that is a way of sacrifice. And that sacrifice is manifested in the daily recitation of the divine office, in the regular and consistent pursuit of an apostolate at the service of the church, and to a bold Christian testimony before all men, as our, our fourth vow, our fourth promise makes us do. And that by doing this daily, we walk the walk rather than talking the talk about being true knights. And that way we can actually have that noble spirit that maybe we do not receive recompense before men, nor do we desire recompense before men. As our, you know, uh, battle cry says, no nobis domine, no nobis, but that we may obtain to the true crown in the kingdom of heaven to become truly poor knights of Christ and recognize as such in the kingdom of heaven when we die. And so... Um, you know, your novice masters, whoever you are, or uh, in, maybe you're not even a member and you're pursuing this, it is their obligation to test you. And we see this you know, with Blessed Raymond Law, because they have to uphold the honor of the, the order, the honor of the brotherhood, the honor of chivalry as a whole. Therefore, unite who are charged with the duty of examining a squire, are bound more strongly to seek out high qualities of valor in a squire than in any other person. Also, you have the job of inspecting the squire who aims to enter the order. You ought to find out whether he wishes merely an opportunity to travel and receive honors without doing honor to chivalry and to those who honor it. So this was a problem, you know, 700, 800 years ago. And more or less, we have to view chivalry, which is a Christian testimony, which first and foremost concerns itself with men being godly who will defend the Holy Church. Um... They have to find men who believe that is true chivalry, not necessarily living history or um, an honorary title bestowed on by uh, nobility. And if you do, and if you are able to live by the code of chivalry, always remember uh, what the rule, our rule says, set your trust in God. 
Attribute to him and not to yourself whatever good you discover within you, but be aware that evil comes from us and accept the ensuing responsibilities. And so the ability to even live by the code of chivalry is a grace. And not only that, if you ever wonder, does God, is this what I'm called to? When you choose to live by the code of chivalry, when you choose to live by the rule, right? God gives you the grace if you're called to it to do it. He will help you. He will uh, guide you through it. And that is part of the process of discernment. Now, no one, we, there are six precepts of the church and 10 commandments of God. If you wish, as our Lord says, you know, if you wish to have eternal life, keep the commandments. And if a Catholic keeps the commandments, uh, fulfills the precepts of the church, frequents the sacraments, and does his best as a layman, he can, you know, go to heaven and so forth. But to those who have received the call from God uh, to pursue, right, and be perfect, as he also tells us, be perfect, and feels the call to knighthood, and feels the call to live out the code of chivalry, one takes upon themselves not just the six precepts of the church, but 17 additional precepts, all of which are taken from the gospel. And our rule, right, if you join to join our brotherhood, our rule, which I believe is 23 pages uh, additional. Now, all of it's taken from the gospel, all of that, but we must cling to it. And the way we could live before as a layman is no longer open to us after we take upon the commitment of knighthood. And so with that, uh, let us grab our sword, the sword of the gospel, and thrust it in at ourselves and do violence to ourselves so that we can cut out from us anything that obstructs that chivalric virtue, which gives an honorable testimony to the Christian faith and will please our forefathers from the past. That today, even though we are not trained from you know childhood to be men at arms to defend or to go to war in the Holy Land or to destroy bandits or other people who invade our lands, uh, but that we can provide a strong and faithful testimony to the Christian faith and be, be virtuous and be by that virtue, prepare to do anything in the service of God's church in its defense, whether that is with uh, a testimony through our uh, words or a being an, an apologist for the faith, or even with our blood, uh, if one day we are called to martyrdom in the increase, increase increasingly hostile anti-christian environment that is becoming the west so do not lose heart then my brother in pursuing your spiritual life there is yet time and your hour is not past why delay your purpose arise begin at once and say now is the time to act now is the time to fight now is the proper time to amend that's taken from the imitation of christ book one chapter 22 and so with that thank you very much for watching this primer on uh, the code of chivalry, where it comes from, and I hope that you got something else uh, out of it. May Our Lady, Queen of the Militia Templi, and the Christ Child bless you abundantly during this time, and may God grant you eternal life. Amen.